what I've done with this piece is used a fine silver ingot uh, that I rolled in the rolling mill and uh, used an impression die to, to build this beautiful Art Nouveau type piece. It's a high relief silver uh, female portrait with a stylized headdress uh, that, that represents wings and her flowing hair is down here as well. So uh, in order to make this I pressed it into an impression die uh, like this one, uh, exactly this one, and uh, that took multiple times and I'll, I'll show you that process. And then I finished it, enameled it on the back uh, as a counter enamel and then applied some enamel to the uh, wings and set a six millimeter natural peridot in the headdress attached a, a standard silver chain and then I oxidized it and buffed it for relief so uh, if, if you're interested in seeing how this kind of a piece was made uh, feel free to stick around if you already know how to do it and uh, aren't interested that's fine uh, have a nice day and uh, as always I, I simply intend these videos as a way to share uh, some of the creative process and if it if it helps or inspires you to make your own stuff that's absolutely wonderful well I'm gonna try and uh, take you along with me while I I do something for the first time uh, which is I got this beautiful uh, partly deep relief high relief um, butterfly fairy Art Nouveau type uh, design and I I have in mind that I'd like to do it in fine silver and these are nice deep recesses in these wings so for my first one I may do an enamel piece where I, I wet pack enamel into these wings and then leave the silver uh, and I'll oxidize it perhaps so the difficult part about these is is that when one part of the die is very deep and the other parts are relatively less deep or shallow um, you know, it, it, it causes you a little bit of problem in that you have to uh, get the deep part first. Kevin Potter has, has shown a couple of examples of this. Um, so what I'm going to do is start with a piece of fine silver. This is an ingot that I uh, I rolled out. It, well, an ingot. It was a it was a piece of a bullion bar that I bought. And so this is about I don't know. I thought it was 16, but maybe it's. Yep, this is 16 gauge, um, and I've annealed it. So the first thing I'm going to do is is use a large piece of urethane, <clears throat> press it a little bit, just to get an outline. I want to see where that deep spot is, so that I can put a tiny piece of urethane right over that. Alrighty, so what I'll do is make sure I've got enough overlap to be useful um, and again this isn't ideal I, I don't really want to press this way but I, I really would like an indication of where that deep spot is so I'll have to be a little careful once I get this cleared and I took out the, the smaller pusher for this part I'll put it back in in a minute um, to make sure that everything is is pushing flat okay so with that, I'll turn on the pump and we will press it and see how, how that looks. Okay, that did what I wanted it to do in that it, it gave me a, a little bit of a ghost outline and I can see clearly where that is. Um, if this doesn't do me much good the first time, I'm going to try and get just a little bit of this in there so that I can get it indexed. But there's a lot to trim on this that will drastically improve the impression. Um, but since I've got it right here, I'm going to find a little, a little chunk of urethane Let's see, and uh, just try to get a little better impression right there in the middle. Yeah, so that helped out quite a bit. Um, 
So it's not not shabby, but it, it's got a ways to go yet. So the next step will be to trim the piece, at least some. And for the initial trimming, I'll save myself some time and uh, I'll just use my, my shears and leave a couple of millimeters around. Up here I want to leave a little more because I, I might, I envision putting two jump rings here to uh, make a, a, a necklace type of an arrangement. And I like to have backing of the component metal, even if I solder a jump ring on top of it, that makes it much, much sturdier than if I simply solder the jump ring directly to the, to the wings. Um, it, you can do that, and, and I've done that in the past. It's just uh, what I prefer. So first thing I'm going to do is just use my shears and cut this and then re-anneal it. Okay, so for my next uh, initial impression, I'm just going to use urethane here. Um, I'll see how it does with urethane and fine silver, and if I need to, uh, as Kevin Potter showed how, once how to do, I'll make an aluminum force that I can use to drive that face in if I can't get the nose, for example. But for now, I'll just try urethane. Um, I like to put a little 3-in-1 oil on the die just for grins and then register it. I'm going to let this let's let this down a little more so that for this one I can put on a tool steel pusher. Let's make sure that that's lined up. Yeah, that looks good. And we'll take a a little chunk of urethane, a slightly larger one maybe, but I'll try this little one first. This one probably won't fit in there, no, not with all my spacers. I do use some quarter inch so I could take it out, but I'm just going to drive this one in first and see how that works. Okay. That went in pretty well. I have a feeling I still didn't catch the detail I'm going to want, but I'm not too far off. So, um, hmm, I might just try again with some urine into that deepest part of the depression, but uh, I'll give it a try here and see what we Okay. Ooh, that stuck a little better. Yeah, almost. So I'm going to go ahead and anneal this again. Uh, well, no, I'm going to push this flat first, and then I'll I'll anneal, trim a little closer. I'm going to try to get that that face just a little bit, press better. a little bit at a time. Other times, I take it out. It's not that big of a deal. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so you can see that, that uh, even without trimming, that does pretty well, but this can be much, much more detailed here. So I'm going to go ahead now and trim this a little better, anneal it, and we're going to keep pressing. I may make the aluminum force so I can get that face really, really nicely. Oh, and a, and a quick aside, I... Uh, have a recent acquisition, which is this absolutely phenomenal electric pump um, that runs a, a relatively large 4-inch RAM 
in the potter press and uh, yeah I can't say enough good about this the, the, this is so much more controllable um, and feels much more stable and safe plus it's a lot faster it's easier on me no matter what uh, than anything I've had in the past so uh, that's what I'd be using from now from now on into the foreseeable future because um, it, it really works super well Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, even though I've annealed and trimmed that piece, I'm going to make an aluminum force, like uh, much much like Kevin Potter showed. And to do that, the first thing I'll do is take this chunk of aluminum rod, <clears throat> and I'll heat it up. And we'll do this press. This is a really easy one to do, so I'll do this one hot and see how much of an impression we get. Okay, it's a fairly hot piece of aluminum uh, just off the torch. And the positioning for this first one isn't critical because it's going to uh, hopefully go into the impression anyway. Okay, so there we go. We've got that lined up, centered. Now it's centered. Okay, let's see what that did for us. It certainly looks like it uh, compressed quite a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, so, all right, we can do a little better, but which I will do. I'll do another uh, heating and uh, annealing, and then we'll press it again. I may put a little bit of uh, aluminum on the back here just to push this front in, but uh, that will do quite well. Okay, third time. Yes, indeed. Let's see what we're getting. Get Ooh, almost there. Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and press this rather than uh, try to put a, a, a rod back here, uh, which which will do it, but that you have to actually be pretty careful with because it'll deform the Dickens out of the force. Um, but this, this probably would be pretty close to okay. The nose still isn't there, but there still should be quite a bit of metal in the uh, uh, the original here uh, that that would press in. And if not, I can always put a little bead of silver right back here on the nose to give it more metal there to push. Um, but right now, the force is about where I was able to get it, a little better than what I was able to get it with urethane here with just a couple pushing. So I'm just going to go ahead and try to get this force a little bit more detailed and uh, then we'll press the silver. Okay, just a couple of pressings and uh, this aluminum force looks really quite nice. So what I'll do now is use this on the annealed and trimmed silver and we'll see how that goes.
Okay, let's see what we have. That's pretty good. That is almost perfect. Um, yeah, I may I may just leave it like that because the, this is really nice. So what I'll do is I'll next use some urethane on the back of this deepest part and start pressing the rest of this solid. I may need to trim it again in order to get uh, very sharp impressions all around. I uh, you notice my thinking process here is I left uh, some metal here and here <clears throat> thinking about jump rings and I also <clears throat> excuse me left a little bit here just in case I decide to add a gemstone to this. I may not on this one but um, I don't have to make that decision immediately so I wanted to see what the composition looked like. Cool. So let's uh, I'll go ahead and press this without annealing to see, see what we get. And then Alrighty so I've trimmed it again and annealed it. You can probably see that. And it, it actually looks pretty good right now, but um, especially here at the tips and down here needs just a little bit more definition. And I didn't entirely trim all the way in there. I just wanted to leave that <coughs> for the time being and leave that for the final trimming. Um, so now I'll just press it again and see what we wind up with. Okay, now that that's in there, I'm going to take this urethane out and we're going to be pressing as solidly as we can. Make sure that's centered there. I'm interested to see what we have. These are looking pretty good. Um, leaving this metal on makes it a little harder to get good definition, but not not too bad. Yeah, I'm going to need to put some urethane or cardboard at these tips to make up for what I'm lacking because this metal here is is holding the the metal here from getting depressed all the way in. Um, but that's okay. I'll just use some cardboard bits on these sides and that should do it. So I'll just anneal this again and cut a little couple pieces of cardboard and we're close to being finished with the pressing part. So now what I have is uh, the piece in the in the die ready to press and there's just a tiny piece of urethane there and then I'm going to put some cardboard on these tips and wing tips and that will help me push those in quite a lot. Um, I'm going to first put on a couple pieces like that and I'm going to just for grins add a couple more just to give myself a little bit of cellulose and lignin to, to push in there. Okay, so we'll line that up. We'll take it a little slow to start. Let's see where that got us. You know, the, the cardboard compresses really quite tightly. You can see that it uh, actually takes some of the impression. And there's my urethane. And we'll now try to pry that puppy out. Yeah. Oh, 
sounded pretty good. Yeah, I can do just a little bit more on these tippy tips, but I got most of it. So we're almost there, but I, I'm, I'm a stickler for this. This one can pick up, especially this side here, can pick up a little bit more. Okay, so first is my fine silver uh, stamp, and I'm going to mark it right about there. Yep, that looks nice. And then is my signature stamp, and again, I, I took a chance on this. Um, I had a couple nice ones that were built for me, and I wanted something small, um, very small profile, that would allow me to stamp my signature onto like fine earrings and very fine ring shanks. So I did this. This is about as small as I think I could theoretically get. Um, and it, what I did was I, I signed my name using my, uh, my, my Apple pen on my iPad. And it, so it, it's exactly the signature that I would use if I, if I hand engraved it. And I, I'd have, I would have trouble engraving something that small. There are people who do that routinely, but I'm not one of them. Um, so I'm just going to line this up. And, oh yeah, that looks quite nice. So I'll be either using a, a transparent counter enamel or on an example of this that I might just do oxidized or in sterling, uh, that would be sufficient. Okay, so the next step for me is going to be to solder some jump rings here. Um, to strengthen the attachments for the chain and I'll decide on a stone and a stone setting that I, I will put there um, and it, it can be anything it, 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 it really is a very pretty design but I'll, what I'll do is I'll think a little bit about the enamels I'm going to use and try to put a nice uh, stone there that would, would complement the, uh, the design and the colors well, I've decided to uh, to mount a very clean little six millimeter natural peridot there because um, with fine silver I I tend to go for greens and blues I might use a little transparent on her headdress and either I'll either use a green enamel gemstone in her headdress or a a little red one just to uh, offset that green a little bit um, yeah, so anyway, I, I, next step is simply I'll build a simple bezel for that stone soldered in and start the trimming and uh, Okay, polishing. so now I'm left with an hour or three of handwork uh, to get this to a point that uh, it can be enameled. Um, but it's, it's, it's close. So uh, what I find interesting is as much as I, I love to, to do the die stamping, um, I know there are folks out there who think that if something is die stamped by hand that, you know, it's, it's easy. It's like an automated process. Well, you know, some things are. Um, but when you're using it like I use it to make individual pieces, um, it, it is really just a substitution for casting or 3D printing or CNC milling or something like that. It, it still takes a great deal of uh, time, skill, and effort. Um, but the results can be so outstanding that uh, I, I just I, I love using it, and it, it's a, it's a just an incredibly useful addition to my studio and the way I prefer to work. Um, so you get pieces like this that are, you know, I, I might only make five of these or, or six of them in my in my lifetime. I don't know. Um, depends on how many people like them, uh, but. Uh, I, I can do it. I mean, that, that, that's a that's a real real benefit to this technology.
that's pretty. Alrighty, so let me see something here real quick. Let's see, there's a little bit of dirt in here, but let's see what that's going to look like. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that's pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, we keep working. Keep working. But that, that's got a nice polish on it. Uh, even if I oxidize silver, I like to have it polished. And so that's open back pretty well. Um, yeah. We'll get this ready for the first bit of counter enamel, and then I'll load wet packed enamel into these areas of the wing uh, headdress, uh, just because I think it's so darn cool. Okay, well, of Neat. course there's not one way to do this, but uh, I'll toss it in for a little while to the sonicator. It, uh, I, run, I run water with simple green and ammonia, <clears throat> um, but you can do anything. That's pretty nice. It's looking good. Okay, next I will give this a little bit of time in the pin polisher, uh, just to just to make sure that that surface in the some of the areas where I, I have trouble getting in with the the discs benefit a little bit from the pin polisher. Uh, where the pin polisher I find really does a job is on pierced pieces. Um, that really helped me get high quality finishing on, on the piercings that I like to do. Um, but it, it helps even for a piece like this. It's looking pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of a couple drops of shine bright back in the water, which helps those stainless pins stay nice. And next step, let's prep this piece uh, now for some color. So make sure you keep your enamel station clean, uh, unlike what I do. So. What I'll do here is I'm just got I've got some acetone on a Q-tip from the applicator, and I'm just gonna give that a wipe. Even though it's been sonicated and cleaned and go look at that, see? There's just still a little bit of junk that can come off with the acetone. That'll be more important on the upside, the other side of this, but um, I'm not that worried about this bezel area, so I'm just going to hold it there. And then I'm going to spray a little fire clear on there. Again, not strictly necessary for this, but I, in my limited experience, I've found that that seems to help. Now, I'm going to be using uh, blues and greens on this, so I think what I'll do is I'll use a counter enamel that is a transparent aqua blue from Thompson's. And sometimes I use a 40, but I want a thinner coat, so I'm just going to use my my 80 mesh applicator and sifter. And again, you know, you you don't need the clear fire, but one of the things I picked up from one of the YouTube folks, I I, I apologize, I can't remember who. Um, 
pointed out that that by using a clarifier to adhere the enamels, you more consistently get it to cover the, the very edges. Uh, otherwise, if you go dry, I found that uh, it'll work fine, but, but it almost always I leave like a half a millimeter or a quarter millimeter right at the edge that isn't isn't well covered and uh, you know it's not a disaster but it just looks goofy so I'd rather not do that okay now I'll put a good a good coat covering on this and mostly concerned with these these wings of this headdress okay Okay, so that looks pretty good. Now, even though there's no enamel yet on the front side of this, um, I inevitably have bits of crap or enamel on, on the screen or somewhere, and so I'm using a trivet, even though it's probably not strictly necessary, but it's, it can be helpful. So because I use clear fire, I'm going to start with the torch way below. It evaporates very quickly, but still, I want to make sure that I don't get enamel jumping off of the back. So I'll start slow, let it warm up a little bit. And then when I'm pretty sure that everything is dry and adherent, I'll come up and give it a blast. Okay, that looks pretty good. I let it set for just a moment to make sure that the enamel is, is going to be set. And then I'll separate it from the trivet, put the trivet in some water just because I'm lazy. And then I set this down on the fire brick. Yeah, and then I will uh, take it over and clean the front side and get it ready for wet packing some enamel into the headdress. Well, what I've done is uh, cleaned this piece again on the front. I uh, used the Sonicator solution and a wire brush and, and scrubbed it. And then a clean Q-tip with acetone to wipe it off. And I'm ready to wet pack some enamels. And for this project, I've decided, since I've got a nice green peridot in there, I'm going to use uh, Peacock Blue, Aqua Blue, or no, this is Prussian, sorry, Prussian Blue, Aqua Blue, and Peacock Green. Um, the, the green looks a little dark, but it, it's a nice green. It's a transparent green. And as much as I love all of the colors of Thompson's enamels I have so far, um, I have a, a particular kind of, I've got a little bit of a color blindness. Um, I'm, I'm red-green color blind. And, and what that means, though, is not that I don't see color. It's that I, I see them a little differently, and especially greens are muted in my, in my vision. Um, so, I mean, that may be one reason why I'm not a bad landscape painter with oils, because things that look muted to me are actually probably a little more uh, vibrant than I, than I think they are. So they may look good to other people, I don't know. Uh, in any event, I'm going to sort of wet pack here. I've got to, just like painting, I'm, I'm, I've got to decide on a color scheme. And if you look closely at these patterns, you will almost always notice that the artist intended um, a particular design. And so uh, you can see that there's some, some voids, some, some hollows that go from the center all the way out as a consistent piece. And now that, that is interrupted with cross bridges of silver. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the darker blue, the Prussian blue, in all three of the chambers as we move from the center out. And I'm going to start with the darker, nearer the face, and then I'll put in aqua blue in some of the other areas, and then in the periphery I'll alternate aqua blue and um, and and the Prussian blue. I may pop a green down here because I'm going to use green right now, mostly just in the little jewel in the headdress. So let's see what we can do. Uh, I'm sure you know people that do this well probably have all sorts of things that they do that are different from what I do, but 
I, I'm just a novice here. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I've, I've cleaned these enamels. I've washed them many times with water, distilled water. And then I, what I do is I like to pick up a little bit on my brush and I'll try and manipulate a little bit into the void and then use the water to push it. There we go. Now I'm going to go over and do this other one before I forget what I just did on that side so that I have a shot at doing something even modestly consistent. Perfect. Okay. And we'll keep going. This one has a little tiny spot right there. Right there. This is tinier on this side. So we'll just put a little tiny bit of blue there. And then it continues on. see where I'm going to use some green up here just above these bits there's a very narrow hollow right here uh, that would benefit from some green question blue but for the moment I'm going to go with that. Now I keep a little dish of water over here just to rinse off my brush and my pick. I just use a cheap steel pick uh, for these things. And now I'll take a look at the at the aqua blue. It's a little wet. So it may be hard to see some of the detail here, but uh, all I did was finish filling in where I wanted the blues and greens. Um, and I, I'm, I'm letting it, I let it dry some. I'm going to use a little piece of toilet paper and very carefully, I like to do a little detail work right now. It just, it just saves me time and effort and worry later. So what I'm doing is I'm lifting, trying to remove a little bit of the glass grain where I might have covered a bit. Okay, it's uh, cross finger time. It's a good sign that uh, over the last hours the, the counter enamel on the back has not popped off. So that's very good. And again, since this is wet pack, even though I've allowed it to dry, again, you know, we'll uh, start slow. Yeah, see things will shift just a little bit. You want to be careful. And then, as soon as I'm confident that it's not moving again, I'll go up and we'll heat it. And it's moving a little bit yet, but it's okay. Stop now. Let it go clear. All over and I got it. Okay. To be a little careful with soldered bits because you don't want them flying off. Um, but uh, yeah, that looks like it might have been okay. So let's give it a second. And put my trivet in the water. And that will cool now for a while. And then what I'm going to do, I'll, uh, I'll use a fine, very fine diamond uh, bit 
and go along and just touch up any areas that look like they might have a, a glass crystal uh, or nugget where I don't want it. And we're close to being done. See, I, I really like the way the transparent enamels do on the, on the counter enameling because uh, even with the torch on them, they, they don't go really, really too bad. So that looks very pretty. Yeah. Alrighty, there we go. Well, I have to admit, um, I, I did pretty well on this, so I'm not going to go overly crazy trying to uh, grind anything away. There's just one or two spots that I'd prefer be a, just a titch sharper. So sometimes, you know, it, it, if you just have a teeny bit to do, you can do it very simply. If you have more to do, then you're wise to use water and... Or use a little split. Okay, I, I think what I may be doing right now is um, I may go ahead and set the stone because when, when I oxidize this, I'll use, I'll use a, a chemical oxidizer. In this case, I won't use liver of sulfur. I'd, I'd like a darker uh, patina on this silver. So I'm going to use Black Max, which is a Midas product. It's, it's a heavy metal acid. Um, and I'll just use a Q-tip to apply it. So I might go ahead and set the stone since it has a very open back. I'm not worried about trapping stuff underneath it and I'll be rinsing things anyway. Um, and then after I set the stone, I will maybe make a, or attach a chain. I'm just gonna take a commercial chain, cut it in half and use jump rings to attach it. <laughs> 